Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar. I'm going to go ahead and begin. Um, some of you may be wondering why I have a picture of an ulcer to start the recap of this year's annual marketing partner forum. You may be thinking that working in legal marketing can give you ulcers, and while for some people that might be true, that's not quite the reason. So ulcers were known to come from stress. Maybe even one of your family members thought that a stomach ache you had at a holiday party was an ulcer because you were working too hard. But as you can see, picture to the right, many years ago, two Australian doctors, they made a scientific breakthrough discovering that ulcers were not caused by stress. They were actually caused by a bacteria. And one of the doctors believed this so much that he actually drank a glass of the bacteria and had an ulcer. And it really turned medical dogma on its head. But as a result of the discovery, ulcers were transformed from a chronic debilitating condition to one that can be solved after a short regimen of antibiotics. So what does this have anything to do with legal marketing? Well, despite evidence, concrete evidence, disproving the theory of ulcers being caused by stress, it was very, very difficult for the greater population to move away from the concept and belief that they carried for so long. And this is exactly one of the major themes of the conference. The ability to adapt is a very difficult subject. I think most of us are adverse to change. I think that we can all agree that lawyers particularly are adverse to change. We speak to so many professionals all the time that are wedded to past practices. I mean, I've heard many times, oh, I've, I've, I've received all my business through my phone. I mean, my phone rings off the hook, I get a matter, I get a deal. And that's great, but it's like pushing a boulder uphill to get them to consider a change to their practice or their marketing. And we can, I'm sure many of you heard this quote from Charles Darwin. He famously said, it's not the strongest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. So the ability to adapt is something that a lot of the panelists talked about in their sessions. I think everyone can see that the legal space is really changing. And so the idea here is if we don't adapt or evolve to this change, we will soon become extinct. And need I remind you of companies like Kodak and Blockbuster and all these companies that used to exist and really because they didn't adapt. So this notion of adapting tied into our fabulous keynote speaker at the conference, Dr. Moyo. She is a global economist and best-selling author. That's her book that she published, Edge of Chaos, one of many. Her presentation really focused on the current state of our world's affairs that's threatening our economy's health. She had a book for everyone at the conference, which is really great. I, I did re read her book, and she directly touched on the ability to adapt is really the key to turning around our grim global outlook. So I just want to read very quickly an excerpt from her book that you'll see on the slide. This excerpt was about retooling history's greatest engine of growth, democratic capitalism. And the quote says, too much is at stake for us to remain wedded to the status quo. We cannot cling to past practices and old ideologies simply for their own sake. Doing nothing is no choice at all. Doing nothing is no choice at all is a very powerful statement. I'm going to talk a lot about this today. I'm going to talk about the need to adapt and keep in mind, this is a three-day conference, so this was it's difficult to, de to deduce this down into 45 minutes, but I'm really going to focus on takeaways because every time I listen to a presentation or a webinar, I want to know what can I do when I go back to my desk and implement. So um, keep in mind as well, Marketing Partner Forum is geared toward larger law firms, but much of this that I'm going to talk about today can be applied to small law firms as well as a range of professional service firms. So a quick introduction on who I am. My name is Megan Braverman. I'm a principal with Burbay Marketing and Public Relations. We work with law firms and other professional service businesses to increase visibility that fuels revenue growth. If you have any questions whatsoever, please contact me after the webinar. I'd be happy to discuss via email or on the phone. Okay, so to begin, 
I want to start with the MPS survey that's presented by Sylvia with Law Vision Group and Stephen with White and Case. So every year they have this presentation. It's a data-driven presentation on trends in legal marketing and business development. It's a really great precursor to this webinar. So the next several slides are statistics from the Thomson Reuters Legal Executive Survey, which surveyed nearly 150 law firms. So what was really refreshing about this year, I've been to this conference for many years, I think about five or six years now. What was great is that 2018 was a very strong year for law firms, and that's demonstrated in these two graphs. So the graph on the left shows that there was a 1.3% growth in demand for law firms, and that's divvied out by AMLAW 50, which grow, grew by 3.4%, AMLAW 100 by 3%, and then mid-sized law firms by 0.5%. The graph on the right shows the average rate increase, which grew by 3.1%, which is, which is an interesting trend, and it's a big deviation from prior years. This could be a testament to more pricing discipline and client back discounts, but all in all, a very positive trend for law firms and one that we haven't seen for many years. So on this next graph, um, this highlights the greatest challenges for marketing and business development professionals and lawyer engagement still remains the biggest challenge sitting at the top at 62%. This has not changed for many years. Following that at 12% is external market change. I think one of the big reasons lawyers lack motivation or involvement in marketing is they don't always see tangible results quickly. So marketing and BD professionals not only need to equip attorneys with the tools to market effectively, but they also have to motivate and encourage them to keep I really just to keep on keeping on, even when it's difficult to see progress. And, and not to mention the shortage of time attorneys have. And I'm sure every marketing and BD professional on this webinar can relate to the fact that lawyer engagement in these activities is, is a huge challenge. The next graph shows what is considered to be the most effective marketing activity. So client visits, client education, and client interview programs sit at the top all very clearly client focused and following that includes competitive intelligence and PR. The, the interesting change from previous years is competitive intelligence and PR really have moved up over the last several years. So wh what I thought was really interesting comes with these next two graphs. So the graph on the left, it shows the level at which a firm develops and monitors revenue forec forecasts. The number I find extremely alarming is that 41% of firms are not using sales and revenue forecasts. And then similarly, the slide on the right asks respondents how marketing and business development effectiveness is measured. While it's no surprise that some of the leading answers are increase of business or existing activities such as RFPs, I think what's equally alarming to me is that 22% of firms don't measure ROI. I've given so many presentations on the importance of measuring marketing, and I'm just, it surprises me year over year that more firms are not doing this. I think that measuring sales, revenues, or ROI of each one of your marketing and business development dollars will not only help you better understand the effectiveness of a particular campaign, but it allows you to forecast better. This information to me is the foundation of any business, and it's very critical when determining where you spend your marketing dollars. As, as a PR agency, people ask us this question all the time. I mean, where, you know, what's the magic bullet? Uh, really, to me, the magic bullet is you, you've got to measure because you really just don't know anything unless you measure it. So this is some of the overview of these data highlights, which I think are great, but what do you do with all this? So Sylvia and Steve discussed three takeaways from the survey, which I'm gonna outline, and I think they're really worthwhile. So the first one is prioritization. Prioritization is the selective allocation of your firm's revenue. So the survey indicated that 81% of firms are prioritizing and targeting their investments. So some of the common areas that pop up here on the slides, healthcare, IP, corporate M&A, and others. I think that this is a really important point from a marketing standpoint. So, I mean, we see a lot of firms. They're a jack of all trades, but a master of none. I can't tell you how many times I, I sit in a room with, with lawyers or professional service firms, and they, 
they tell us that they do everything, that they have, you know, 40 practice areas. I think that there is huge value in talking about industry expertise. When, when we talk with professional service firms, we always ask, who are your primary target markets? One answer we've heard many times is that their target market is entrepreneurs. And I, I always pause with this because you cannot, you absolutely cannot market to all entrepreneurs. It's just not possible to target such a large and ambiguous group of people. And you also dilute your marketing efforts. So I, I find that a lot of firms are resistant to this idea, you know, resistant to trying to segment or go after a particular industry or a particular practice area. I think a lot of people, I mean, right off the bat, they're afraid it will cause them to lose business or they, people will only think about them for business related to a certain area. We have seen, I mean, we've been in business for over 20 years. We have seen that the opposite is true. Your marketing becomes more efficient the more focused it is. If you can create an area that you're an expert in, then you will make inroads and take advantage of additional opportunities that exist. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the webinar because another panelist touched on this, but I want to get to the next takeaway, which is efficiency initiatives. So these are basically legal processes and project management. It's, it's, I like to use the word productivity improvement. I mean, basically what we're talking about here is being more productive. Um, and I think there's a lot of things outside of just legal processes and project management that are quote unquote productivity improvements. So I'm going to use that word. So a growing number of firms have implemented or are contemplating formal productivity improvement initiatives. So as you can see here, the first bar, it says not considering legal process. So in 2016, 42% of firms were not considering legal processes. And then as it to 2018, that really cut in half. Now, 23% are not. So this number is really growing in terms of its focus. And then the last one about not considering legal project management in 2016, that was 42%. And today, or last year, excuse me, is 15%. Um, so you can see a big change. I think law firms are coming to realize that they need to adapt to the changing marketplace and are finally doing it. Keep in mind, productivity improvements require a huge amount of effort, and it may involve hiring additional staff, but I believe that long-term survival depends on continuously improving productivity, and that's not just for law firms, that's for every business. So the third and last takeaway from this session focuses on client account management, which is very much a new term for the legal space. It's, it's really only been around for a couple of years, and I don't hear it that often. Um, this really evolved from the, the word client teams. I think a lot of people understand what client teams are. Client teams, um, it, it kind of turned into this client account management, which is it's basically a strategy account manager or a dedicated team tasked with growing current client accounts. So according to the survey, 15% of firms are investing in client account management. And I, they're doing this because panelists noted that Firms feel they get better results with salespeople, which to me, you know, if you would have said that 10 years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. But one example a panelist gave is, is the client said they always get directed to the right partner when they have an issue. And I think that's really important. The salesperson can really know the firm inside and out and know exactly who the client should be directed to. But it does take a lot of time for salespeople to get to this place. I think there's a lot of lawyer pushback on this. You really have to go have patience as you go through the buy-in process. One firm, it took one year for them to get it off the ground, but they launched without any pushback. But the panelist said that her her sales teams were her salespeople were just sitting around doing doing nothing and just trying to pitch in where they could because it, it just took so much to get to convince people that this was the right path. Um, but once they launched a year later, they, it, it worked out really well. So, okay, so now that you have an idea of where we're headed and what as legal marketers we should be thinking about, I'm going to dive into our next session on coaching the next generation of law firm partners. Um, this was moderated by Craig with Law Vision Group, and the panelists include one managing partner of a law firm, two partners of, a, of separate law firms, and a, and a chief strategy officer. So during the session, we did a quick group exercise. Basically, everyone had to list separate independently. They had to list three traits they believed 
that best the best leaders possess. So we all wrote them down and then we shared them and, and, and someone from the panel wrote them down on a big whiteboard. Um, so most of these words on the screen will not come as a surprise to you. Communication, cheerleader, integrity, smart. I mean, these are all words that you would think of a leader. But one person who happened to be sitting next to me stated the servant model. And this really stuck with me, a, a servant to the greater good. R this is a firm first person. And this, this very much resonated because the servant model puts a person in leadership because they want to help. You know, this servant leader, they share power, but they put the needs of others first and help people develop and perform as highly as possible. So I really liked that word, the servant model. Um, okay, so this, you know, I was thinking this in my head, but this is all great, but how do you find that gem of a leader for your firm? Because it's such a difficult thing to do. I mean, it's difficult just to find a great lateral, let alone someone to lead the firm. So I'm gonna go through a couple things that, that you should think about when you're picking a leader. The first is finding a leader amongst lawyers brings its own set of challenges. I mean, you're essentially asking this lawyer to take on two completely different full-time jobs. So that being considered, you have to have the ability to focus on leadership. If they have an extremely busy practice, then you need to take that into consideration as you might be setting them up to fail as a leader and that never turns out good. Davis Wright Tremaine, the, the chief strategy officer, said that they really focus on young leaders and, and some of these were, it was really surprising to me. So two out of 12 of their leaders have been in practice for 15 years only. They created this future leader program for new partners and it was really, it's an initiative that's worked out really well for them. Uh, there is some downsides, of course. Uh, the you know one downside is that these younger lawyers usually are in a key place in their practice. They said to help with that, the firm hires support staff to help fill in the gaps where 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 needed. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting initiative. A lot of people you know talk about focusing on young leaders, but I think the fact that that uh, Davis Wright Tremaine really focused on a program for it is really smart. Um, the other takeaway here is some, some other ways to pick a leader is not picking one. I think, you know, sometimes you need different people with different characteristics to work together. I mean, we're in the creative field. Anytime we're brainstorming or talking about strategy, we always have more than one person in the room. I think it's really important. I think this is, helps equate to a better product. And I, I don't think a lot of firms consider having more than one leader, but I think it's a really smart way of, of going about it. Um, the other aspect um, is that, you know, outsourcing leadership positions can be critical. I think one of the panelists said, and this really, I think was great, was that they said that if everyone in the room is a lawyer, you typically get one way of thinking. So uh, a lot of panelists said that they were, they were open to outsourcing. A lot of them have, have done it and it really worked well for them. Okay, another panelist reinforced that you always have to remember some people don't want to be leaders. You, you know, you need the finders as much as the grinders. So I thought that was really important. You also need to be open-minded. I think when you're selecting a leader, a lot of people have this idea of who the leader is going to be and on what timeline. And I think that one panelist said this to best, the best. So when we were looking at that board of the best traits of leaders, cheerleader, smart, integrity, one of the panelists said that her mentor and leader didn't have a single one of those qualities. And this is her mentor for many years. And in fact, when I think of my mentors over the years, I can tell you that that best, the list of traits on that board, they may have had one or two. But obviously me and this person, they, I mean, these leaders had to have a different way of doing things and it clearly worked for her. It clearly worked for me. So you have to be open-minded to who the leader is and, and don't always try to fit them in, in a box. Um, many panelists also agreed to personality tests. At the end of the day, um, personality tests can be very insightful. And I think that a lot of firms are using these more and more. Um, the next one is, is, and most of the panelists agreed that one of the most important aspects is a, of a personality is humility. And it's really knowing that there are things you are not good at. And lastly is many people don't think they're leaders. And so one of the panelists had said, 
that they suddenly will think of themselves as leaders when someone tells them they are. And I thought that was really interesting. So what I want to end with when it comes to uh, the next generation of law firm partners is this. So this is something that Mark with Davis Wright Tremaine had actually opened the session with. He recommended that you ask your leaders two important questions. Do you want to build a pyramid or a mountain range? And do you say why not with a question mark or a period? I thought these were both very probing questions for leaders and something worth using for future leaders. Okay, so moving on, I'd like to segue into an important discussion with a panel of GCs, COOs, and VPs. It was called Stranger Things, Regulation Risk, and the Uncertain Corporate Landscape. Here was the esteemed group of panelists on the slide. They discussed what law firm marketing leaders must consider when they're anticipating the needs of their clients, especially in this unpredictable environment. And I winnowed down their presentation to eight takeaways. So I'm going to go through those with you. So million dollar question, what do in-house counsel want? Um, so number one, all of the panelists said multiple times that nothing makes them happier than when a client knows their business, culture, and competitors. So how do you do this? So some suggestions from the panelists were tour the company and don't charge them for it. To me, I think that's an obvious, but a lot of people don't do it. Go to your client's uh, location for a day or two and, and just ask them to see the ins and out of their business. I think it's a really great way to get to know them on a professional and personal level. The other, the other suggestion was ask to meet their clients. I mean, I think there is nothing better than meeting who your clients have to answer to. I think that would be incredibly insightful. Um, one of the panelists said that second D's is also a great way for younger lawyers to learn the client's business from the inside. Audrey with Aon Corporation said that law firms would be very smart to have a stable of second D's and that, that they can just send. I think she actually mentioned that when she asked a law firm about a second D, they said they didn't have anyone at the time and she felt that that was a real lost opportunity. But regardless, all the panelists agreed that understanding the business is table stakes today. Number two, get ahead of the issues. Don't wait until they happen. So without a doubt, the panelists hammered on this. They agreed that the professionals who stand out are those that bring knowledge and anticipate needs. The word that they used a lot were those who can look around the bend. You know, this also means beyond the business perspective. They're looking for a deeper foresight, predictions, anticipation of risk. Again, look around the bend and what does that mean to them? Number three is understanding how disruptors affect them. So disruptors mean artificial intelligence, blockchain, data analysis, maybe the political unrest. Um, Cheryl at TMX mentioned they don't just need legal counsel. They need someone who is going to look at the world and tell them what it means for their company from a legal perspective. Narveen with Nationwide Insurance, she had mentioned that states were passing all sorts of laws that conflict with each other. She said she didn't care about the jurisdiction of a law firm so long as that firm understands the local jurisdiction because they need advocates at the local level and the broader level. So that I think that was really important. Number four, no surprises. So the panelists all said that this is how people lose work. Whether it be poor communication or you didn't go through the proper approval process for additional work, they don't want to be caught off guard. So one of the panelists said, too, this doesn't just have to do with bills, because I think a lot of people immediately think, oh, you know, I looked at my bill and there was an extra five grand on it or 10 grand on it. This actually includes picking up the phone before you send something complex or controversial in an email. A lot of the panelists said that there would be issues that they would get via email and they'd have to read through this whole email. And they said, why wouldn't they just pick up the phone and give me a heads up on this? And a lot of panelists agree that that needs to be done more often. Next one is formal yearly sit downs. So one of the panelists said that this is so valuable and critical. It allows the team to recal recalibrate, excuse me, and iron out issues. If you prompt this meeting and you come prepared with a detailed agenda, the panelist at Monica, she's a, she's a GC, Monica Johnson said, this is how you keep your job forever. So I think, and, and really, I'm surprised that more firms aren't doing this. I think the weekly call check-ins are great, monthly check-ins are great, but I think there's a 
there's something that goes a long way with these formal yearly sit downs that talk about a lot, a lot of broader issues. Okay, next is strengthen law firm's investment in R&D. So Audrey with Aon Corporation mentioned that for her, she wants flash reports with four bullets that comes out as soon as there's news relating to them. So this includes, okay, what is the news, what happened and what it means for their company. She said anything later than a couple of hours of the story break is too late. And so I think uh, a lot of law firms struggle with this because they're, you know, they, they're looking to get some news out about a recent law or legislation or update and they just get it out too late. Uh, Audrey also used an example of Axiom. They created a database that helped her get ready for GDPR compliance, and she wondered why other law firms weren't doing that. Next is diversity, and diversity is on everyone's radar. They made it very clear that they do not want to see a group of all male white attorneys, and they want varying perspectives and varying backgrounds. I think one of the panelists, this, this to me was a really interesting point. One of the panelists recommended that larger or even non, small non-diverse firms should partner with diverse firms to go after business. It demonstrates diversity through partnerships. This really struck me because I don't see any firms working together to go after business. And I think that that's really smart. It, it, they also kind of tied this into the fact that, you know, uh, companies are not fooled by, I'm using this word, make believe diversity initiatives. They feel like, oh, they, this firm is promoting their diversity, but when they meet them, the group isn't diverse. Um, so if you're going to promote it, you need to show that you're actually doing it. The last one is following pricing guidelines are crucial. <laughs> the GCs all agreed they hate reviewing bills just as much as you hate struggling to keep track, but having a law firm that actually follows pricing guidelines to a T uh, is really, really helpful for them. Okay, so moving on, the next two breakout panels that I'll be summarizing, it focused on mergers and hiring laterals, which were two very important and timely topics. So one of the panels um, is called Some Assembly Required. It talks about recalibration through mergers, and the other was case studies on lateral integration. So I'm going to start with the mergers. Um, in, in 2018, there were 71 mergers, and this number is increasing steadily. I think many of you have seen through the headlines that mergers can cause major challenges. I mean, we've seen probably more breakups than anything else, but um, there were several reasons why, why this happens. I mean, culture, as you can see, is number one on the list. Whether you move from a more consensus-driven firm to a pyramid-structured one, or let's say east and west coast differences are getting in the way, which, by the way, is a real issue, um, merging two firms can certainly come with a host of challenges. Um, the east-west coast differences were talked about a lot. I think one of the panelists um, had some major issues um, when it came to to hiring uh, to merging with a firm on the West Coast. Um, they just go about things differently, and that was a real challenge for him. Um, and of course, legal and business conflicts are are number two on the list in terms of challenges. Um, the next one that I really liked is the not instant synergy. So. I like the fact that they mentioned that there's no such thing as, as this instant synergy. I mean, you know, it's exciting. You've probably, I mean, I can't imagine how many hours it takes to structure a merger. So you're like excited. Let's say you're the firm that's being acquired or, or merging into a larger infrastructure. I mean, you're looking forward to more work. You're going to get better resources. You get to take advantage of this great infrastructure you never had. And then day one or day 20 or whatever, day 100, whatever it is, you're asking yourself when those perks are going to start taking effect. And the bottom line is that it takes dedicated work and it never, ever happens instantly. So it's extremely crucial to manage expectations in the beginning and know that this rollout to greener pastures might not be for a year or two. Um, so I think that was a really important reminder. Uh, next is partner compensation is always sticky. Uh, Anne with Briggs and Morgan, she was part of a merger where it was two equal firms. So they were able to create partner compensation. Uh, she had explained that uh, the first year together, it, the compensation ran in parallel paths, meaning one firm did their own thing, the other did their other thing. But then after the first year, it transitioned into the new concept that they came up together. Uh, so that 
that is, seems a little bit easier, but for another panelist, um, Mark with Fox Rothschild, who's handled a number of mergers for his firm, said they give a two-year guarantee. I mean, they do a lot of acquisitions and mergers over the years, and um, they'll give a guarantee, and then after the year, you, you're on their, on their compensation track. Um, what I found the most interesting was a comment uh, a, 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 from Joe with White and Case. So he was, Joe was tasked to interview every single partner from every office and make a re recommendation on what could be done in terms of adjusting partner compensation. So he said he had hundreds of interviews around the globe and it was this whole thing, but his discovery was that the system didn't matter. He said it was the perception that compensation was just and fair. So I think that what we can learn from this is that the more you can demystify compensation, the better. Uh, the next is you really need to develop a playbook. I mean, uh, there are so many panelists that talked about this, this unpreparedness. I mean, th that you need to have a, a roadmap. You need to have it for pre-merger, during merger. It's one of the most crucial aspects of, to successful integration. Um, all the panelists had some form of a roadmap. I mean, some panelists, it was more uh, structured than others. Some hadn't really finished it, but were using it. Um, it, it. These roadmaps, one of them included having a spokesperson who had already merged with the firm to talk about their experience, which I think was really smart. Another panelist explained that there was no substitute for FaceTime. It doesn't matter how much you think you know someone, you need to spend face time with them. And that's really how people learn how you know one another works and how you're gonna work together. Um, I think also the, the important aspect of this roadmap is you need to create a system of, of regular reporting. You want it just to ensure that you've covered all your bases. Um, okay, so then last but not least, and I think this is really important, is you need to get ahead of collaboration. So all the panelists agree that this needs to start pre-merger and include all levels of staff. So for example, you know, get, you know, staff cases from both firms. That's an easy one. But the other things is pre-merger, maybe get them to co-write an article or do a presentation together. I mean, basically they said, figure out ways to bring them together and have them get to know each other. They said when they did that, um, you know, whether it's a co-presentation or uh, drafting an article together that they really, I mean, it's almost like they were able to step out and let them collaborate together because they had gotten to know each other and liked each other. Um, I mean, all in all, they said collaboration should never stop, but pre-merger was, was really important. Okay, so moving on to the lateral panel. So to start with some, st some staff on the left, um, so 79% of firms see lateral hiring as a way of boosting revenue. 81% see lateral hiring as a way to build business in a new location. And the sad part is that 73% of merge firms underperformed in terms of revenue. So regardless of what industry you operate in, data suggests a big change in the talent market. And I think all business owners and leaders and, and marketing professionals can understand this. I mean, the talent market is changing by the minute and finding the right lateral hire for a law firm is, is very challenging. They talked a lot about vetting someone beyond their book of business. You know, I hear law firms talk about this all the time. You know, I want to attract someone with a $3 million book of business. Okay, that's great, but they might not be a personality fit or they might not be a fit for your firm culturally. So um, you really need to consider beyond book of business. I mean, some panelists had suggested behavioral and personality interviewing for all potential candidates. Um, another one really said that you need to ask the potential lateral how they share business with others or their collaborative experiences. I mean, if you're a collaborative firm and you expect that of a lateral, I think you need to really probe into that area a lot more than just saying, oh, this, you know, this woman or man has a $3 million book of business. They all agreed that, that this leads to stickier laterals. Um, and then they, just like mergers, of course, making laterals require, it, making laterals a success, it, it, you need to jumpstart that collaboration. So, you know, laterals are likely to stay if they are woven into the fabric of a firm. But unfortunately, the panel said that laterals don't always work out and, and actually a majority don't. So what happens when they don't work out? So this is what we're going to talk about next. 
what do you do when your key lawyers leave? This is whether they're laterals or key lawyers. So um, one panelist, he created a departure team protocol. They called it the SWAT team, which I think is a great name. Um, they all have very specific tasks to complete when a key partner is leaving. Um, and they have check-in points and regular reporting. And this team is just responsible for, for all aspects of, of what happens when a key lawyer leaves. Another panelist said to think of the movie Jerry Maguire. Uh, this is why I put the picture here. But, you know, when Jerry announced when he was leaving, you can't see it in this picture, but you saw everyone in the background with, was on the phone. They were probably on the phone calling his clients. Um, and this is exactly what should happen at a law firm. The second the key partner leaves, you need to be getting on the horn with, with clients. It, it's, but what's so important is that those calls need to have extremely tailored messaging. I mean, you need to know everything that you're doing for that client, every case where the case stands. You need to demonstrate to them that you know everything about the work you have for them and that you're on it. Um, equally important to external is internal messaging. Um, this can really help a lot of the external fallout, and most importantly, it won't lead to a, an exodus. I mean, I think a lot of firms have experienced when one key lawyer leaves, they bring a lot with them. Um, you, gotta, you have to figure out right away who is close to that key partner. They may need a lot of support, and you need to follow through on that. It could be emotional support. It could be that that key partner was really, you know, had their back and always was there you know, sort of go-to person. I mean, maybe it, it could be it could be that. It could just be that that was a big driver of business for that other partner. You need to figure out why they were close and and follow through with how to get them the support that they need. The all the panelists would agree, though, that you should distinguish the difference between a desirable and undesirable lateral departure. I think a lot of times people know that laterals aren't working out, and then they leave and they're somehow disappointed, but I think it should be more of a relief. I think sometimes, you know, the clients aren't a fit or their personality. I think a lot of splits can be amicable. Um, it didn't work out, go our separate ways, we wish you the best of luck. Okay, so the next uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, is this, this great panel, the CMO's relationship to the partner partnership, which I think was a very interesting one, and this was our esteemed panelist. Um, very often than not, I'm sure we can all relate to this, that we, we find that lawyers just may not like the marketing department or they have a distrust for the marketing department. The reality is, is that everyone's going to be a fan and it can create some serious uphill battles for the marketing team. So what happens when someone, a key partner or the managing partner doesn't like you or, and what can you do about that? So we, I'm going to talk a little bit about that with some tips. So if you're walking into a new position and there's some distrust or people don't really like the marketing department, you need to get insight from others on what happened before you. I mean, this can be very eye-opening. I mean, you may discover that the former CMO left a really bad taste in everyone's mouth or didn't do their job or only supported one or two people. I mean, you can get a lot of insight about why they didn't like the CMO or why they didn't like the marketing department. The next is to talk to key partners. To me, this is the most important and overlooked solution to this. You should be asking every key partner, what is of value to you? What do they deem successful? I mean, this allows you to focus your time and truly uncover what they're looking for from you and from a marketing department. I think especially when you're dealing with the managing partner, I mean, talk to them about how they can, how you can help establish themselves as a leader and offer your department to support this. Next, it's try to achieve quick wins through low-hanging fruit. I mean, this is always a great way to develop trust right in the beginning. Pick a few things you can get done in a couple of weeks. These small successes can go a long way in developing trust and establishing a relationship. Maybe it's a quick media quote or a bylined article or a content piece or something, you know, getting them a speaking position. So go after the low-hanging fruit. Four is listen. So this is another overlooked aspect. I think a lot of lawyers feel like they just haven't been heard, and, and that's where their distrust for marketing comes from. So listen and follow the 80-20 rule with this, um, and I think that you can get a lot of insight from just that. Uh, five, don't complain. Nobody likes a complainer, so forget that. You're the master of your own destiny. Drop the complaints and figure out how you can change this and add value. 
last is managing the managing partner. So if the managing partner doesn't like you, I mean, this certainly puts you in a precarious position when you need to follow the same approach as the other takeaways, but also consider finding someone that the managing partner likes to better understand them. It, you know, it could be, you know, finding the managing partner's influences and establishing a relationship with those people. So before I move on, what really hit me over the head during this panel is don't forget that marketing people have a high emotional IQ. And I think, I mean, this makes me laugh because it's so true. I mean, we, I think as marketers do have a high emotional IQ and we see things that others don't see. So know that it could just be a personality issue. Um, I think that, you know, marketers are in the unique position that they've they really have to navigate the pendulum swing between strategy and execution. Um, one panelist said state to where the puck is, which I thought was really smart and probably the only sports reference I'll get. Um, but I, I just thought that was smart, just state to where the puck is. And, and that kind of goes with some of the low hanging fruit. And two, I think you need to always remind attorneys what you can help with. They always forget or they often forget. So, okay, moving on. So, Data, data. Okay, that's all we hear today, which I, I was very excited about this panel um, because it was talking about mastering small data in law firms. And I think that's what I got excited about. It was the use of the word small. So they defined what the difference between small and big data means. So big data is about machines. Small data is about people. This is what to me made sense. Small data is small enough for human comprehension, <laughs> which is, is really important. Big data is finding correlations. Small data is finding causation, the reason why. So whether we have big or small data, we can all agree that arguments are much more persuasive when backed up by data. So what I loved about this panel is that they fully admitted that when we have to rely on attorneys for anything, including small data, we're, we're not gonna get anywhere. I mean, would it be nice if attorneys tracked all their leads and prospects in, our C in a CRM system? Sure. Would it be nice if they used internal systems like the conflict check? Sure. But does this happen? No, probably never. Why? Well, I could go back to the stat on the low attorney engagement, um, but I think what's interesting is what one panelist decided to try to figure that out. So one of the panelists, they we're trying to figure out why attorneys never have time to do anything. And so they did a comprehensive audit of one week of an attorney's time. So they looked at all the requests from human resources, from administration, from finance, from marketing, from office, I mean, you name it. The result was that it would take 1.5 days per week for an attorney to fulfill and field all the requests line at them. 1.5 days per week, which is, I mean, it, it makes sense. So I thought that was a really interesting point. I mean, attorney, you know, they're not just saying they're busy. They, they have a lot of requests um, that are always flying at them. So the, the point of this was that everyone agreed that we need to find other ways to get our data from people that are too busy and, and too overwhelmed to do it. So on this next slide, I highlighted a few ways to do that. So the first is automation, because yes, that's the world that we're living in today. There's a lot of tools out there to find ways to scrape the data. Does it have problems? Yes, it has a lot of problems. But one, one of the moderators said, don't let perfect data be the enemy of good. I think you need to just start with something um, and automation can be a really good solution. Two is client satisfaction surveys. So many law firms are doing this, but they often sit as a Word doc or a PDF. So figure out how you can get that into a system so that you can actually correlate the data and look at trends. Um, and that sort of ties into the third point. So to me, this was the genius idea of the panel. I mean, I, I was like, okay, I, I, this was my aha moment. So one of the panelists, they've been, um, their partners, they have a yearly business plan that they have to submit every year, and they submit it as a work doc. So this um, panelist, she, she asked IT to turn it into an electronic form with specific fields. That turned into data. It turned into data for practice groups, for CRM opportunities. So every time I mean, one of the business plan pieces was to list your prospects and what you're going to do to obtain those. 
those were field entries so that then it can just be turned into some sort of trend line forecasting. They were able to finally see opportunities too that multiple people were going after. I, so I thought that was a really, so think about what you're doing that can be turned into some sort of electronic form and you can start drawing some, some lines together. Um, four is create marketing activity reporting on your intranet. One of the panelists mentioned that every time someone wants to be reimbursed for a marketing activity, like a conference or a sponsorship, it's mandatory that they complete a form on the intranet with specific fields. They now have the ability to pull this information and use it for small data purposes. Um, last but not least is you have to prioritize and you have to call before you walk. I think kind of tagging back onto what I said earlier, you don't need perfect data. I mean, focus on something. Start with the top 100 clients or top 20. You know, find opportunities that multiple people are going after. I mean, you just have to pick and choose. Um, and also, don't be so wedded to cleaning up your data. I know everyone's like, oh, our data is, so, we need, you know, we need to clean it up. First of all, remember that cleanup will never fully happen. I think it's all also about taking chunks and doing the best that you can. So, okay, on this note, I'm, I'm gonna jump quickly to a TED Talk presentation that was given by Robert um, Algieri. He's the founder of Great Jakes. He talked about marketing, uh, excuse me, market positioning. So um, the example that he used is marketing for supermarkets. So supermarkets is an industry that has low growth and severe price compression. And that's really because most supermarkets are all things to all people. But he posed the question, what supermarket is not all things to all people? Whole Foods, of course. Whole Foods market positioning is premium quality and organic food. And their prices certainly reflect that because their prices are, are unlike any other supermarket out there. I know every time I go, I just, I, I never understood what I weigh back because I'm always walking out with a $250 bill. Um, but okay, so who, okay, so the other, the other one he mentioned is Axe Body Spray. They also found their market positioning. Instead of going after the entire male audience, they focused on ages 15 to 25 who were insecure about approaching women. Another company who found their market positioning is Domino's. Domino's Pizza focuses on speed more than the taste of their pizza. So I thought these were all interesting examples, but to me what the common theme is here is that you need to carve out a distinct place in your client's minds. And this in turn reduces the number of competitors. This goes back to the example that I mentioned in the beginning when I said a lot of people say they're marketing to all entrepreneurs and that you just can't market to that large and ambiguous of a group. Well, I know that law firms are not grocery stores, um, but it's equally important to develop their specific market positioning. Um, in Robert's presentation, he did mention three types of positioning that law firms can take, and I think that this is worth including. So he separated this into hard, soft, and silent, and I'll give you a couple examples of this. So hard positioning is explicit messaging. So the, one example that I have on the screen here is Quinn Emanuel, a global force in business litigation. That is explicit messaging. They have, by the way, they have a slew of other practice areas. I'm sure many of you know Quinn Emanuel. In fact, I think they have about 40 practice areas, but they don't let other practice areas muddy up their messaging, a global force in business litigation. So um, another example of, of hard positioning is this firm Beverage and Diamond. So they say they're the environmental law firm. They, they have let go, I think, of the past practice of believing that you need to choose all these practice areas and feature everything and make sure that everybody knows everything that you do. Um, they've let go of that. And th I think everyone should let go of the belief that choosing one practice area is going to hurt so many. So uh, I want to talk about quickly about soft positioning. Soft positioning is expressing spirit or culture. So here's one example from, from Dinsmore. So they have accomplished more is their motto. That really explains the spirit of the firm, not a practice area. Another example of soft positioning is Kazowitz, ben, Benson, and Torres. Um, this is their, their tagline here, creative, aggressive, and relentless. They're describing how they do it. Um, so I thought that was a, these are really powerful statements from a soft positioning place. 
Um, last market position is silent, which uses design, not words. So you're quietly commuting characteristics. Um, Skadden does this really well. I mean, this picture, they have a, a few pictures that, that rotate. But this picture is it's expensive looking imagery. It's, it, there's some prominence to it. It's powerful. Um, and they do this, there's no words on this page except for their firm name, so it's great. Um, Simpson Thatcher is another example of silent positioning. I mean, you see people in their office working. There's a human touch by showcasing their attorneys and Armstrong, uh, excuse me, Armstrong Teasdale does this as well. So if you look on the right, they're also showing people working. Um, but I think that these are all great examples, but regardless of your positioning, everybody agreed that you need to focus strategy and you need to focus your positioning and this will lead to greater opportunities. Um, so I know I'm getting, uh, I'm getting very close to my hour here. Um, so since we covered so much ground, I'm just going to leave you with this last slide. Um, this is a summary of what I think are the pearls of wisdom. And I, I believe these are worth all of our time. I really hope that these pearls allow your firm to continue to survive, adapt, and evolve. Um, I very much appreciate everyone who listened in. I can't tell you how much I, I, I love that uh, we have so many registrants today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, my contact information uh, will be up at the end here shortly. Um, and again, thank you. Thank you for listening.